it's 8 a.m. So we'll go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming to today's RPS GlomCon um, Renal Pathology Webinar Series. Um, tonight, today we have Dr. Anthony Chang from University of Chicago. It's a real pleasure to be here on a, on a nice Sunday with you all. And so we're gonna talk about thrombotic microangiopathy, which you know really has been, I think, a frustrating topic for probably most people. Um, for the pathologist, it's mostly straightforward uh, for us to make that diagnosis, but we've traditionally just kicked it back to the clinicians to say, now, you know, it's your problem. You figure out if it's TTP or HUS or malignant hypertension or scleroderma renal crisis, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, right? The list goes on and on, um, and it requires a lot of that clinical correlation. Um, and it doesn't matter how long we stare at the biopsy, we can't tell you what the etiologies are. Um, but, you know, as I've, I've actually thought about this disease a lot, and mostly because I guess I'll re reveal sort of this conflict of interest uh, with Alexion Pharmaceuticals, I give a lot of talks for them regarding uh, trying to help you make the diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy. And it's really allowed me to kind of hone my thought process about this disease and sort of recognize that complement really is the major mechanism that is connecting all of these different clinical pathologic entities that we have associated with thrombotic microangiopathy. Other than TTP, once you rule out TTP, I now, really do believe that everything else probably is related to complement. And we'll talk about why this makes sense um, because I think we have been thinking about complement or not thinking about it enough or not thinking about it in quite the correct way, okay? And we'll talk about how the complement story is actually analogous to the April L1 story, which clearly has captivated the nephrology community. Um, but this, uh, complement story that we'll talk about is analogous to that. We'll talk about actually thrombotic microangiopathy. Most people think of it as being very acute and catastrophic, and it absolutely can be, but it often has a smoldering form that, you know, really evolves over a long time and accumulates a lot of damage to the different, the different organ systems particularly the kidneys, okay? Um, and there's other diseases that act like this, you know, RPGN, I, I think that that is really a terrible term, unfortunately, because a lot of crescentic GNs actually smolder, particularly the MPO positive cases where you have a lot of fibrous crescents by the time you see the biopsy, you know? So there's other diseases that act like this and absolutely TMA acts like this. And we'll talk about some of that, some of those things. Atypical HUS actually often is the second diagnosis. And, you know, as, as we probably recognize, the most commonly misdiagnosis in medicine is the second one. And when I say the second diagnosis, I don't mean the less important diagnosis. I mean that, you know, a patient may already be labeled with lupus or scleroderma, and you're focused on that disease, and you're not necessarily looking for another mechanism that actually could be the more important mechanism than the original label that that patient already comes with, okay? And it's, you know, thinking about this entity has been fascinating because it's allowed me to understand that we have a cognitive bias towards Occam's razor, towards having a unifying diagnosis. Um, I think that's sort of how we were all trained. And this entity, sort of leans towards Hickam's dictum, right? Where, you know, John Hickam said, your patients can have as many diseases as they damn well please. And we'll talk about how a typical HUS exactly does that. And so as a result of all of these points on this slide, I now believe that a typical HUS is a great masquerader or great mimicker of the 21st century. You know, decades ago, that used to be syphilis, and then it was lupus, and then it was HIV. And if you were disappointed that you missed out on, you know, 
those eras where it really perplexed, right, a lot of physicians when, uh, you know, they were trying to figure those out. Now those are not difficult diagnoses, but a typical HUS is.